Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God for us today is the first lesson of this Sunday, taken from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, reading in chapter 11, beginning at verse 18, these words. Because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it. For at that time, he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let's destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. But you, Lord Almighty, who judge righteously and test heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Beloved, it's a terrible thing to live in fear. I remember back in 1994, I was driving on a longer trip, and I was listening to the news on the radio. And 1994 was the year of the genocide in Rwanda. And it just so happened, this was a national program, and they patched through to a woman who was hiding above the ceiling in a home while the Hutus were going through the village looking for Tutsis or people who looked like Tutsis to kill them. This was a woman who had studied in the United States. She knew lots of Americans. She believed Americans to be really good people and she couldn't understand why the Americans refused to get involved in stopping this terrible genocide. As the conversation went on, I had to pull off the road. I, I simply couldn't listen to that and drive at the same time to realize that at the very moment that I was in the security of my automobile, there was another human being hiding and people searching to kill her. The terror of that moment became very real to me. What do you fear? Do you fear failure at the most important part of your life? Do you fear being abandoned by someone you love? Do you fear terminal illness or death? Do you fear that someone that you love is destroying her life? Or are your fears more the garden variety? You're afraid to speak before a group of people. Fear is not a pleasant emotion, but it has a purpose. Fear is a warning flag. It notifies us that something is not right and it draws our attention to the problem. Imagine if we did not experience fear when we were in danger. We would not be thinking about what we should do. We would be unprepared for difficult situations. Now, interestingly, Jeremiah admits that he had not been afraid. He had not experienced fear at the very time he should have. His enemies were plotting his death, but he was blissfully ignorant of what was going on. Now, he doesn't look back and treasure how calm he felt at that time. He's grateful to the Lord for disturbing his serenity and opening his eyes to the plot against his life. In the moment of his crisis, Jeremiah not only knew his true situation, but for our purposes today, he also knew where to turn. He asked the Lord to help him take care of this situation for him. He committed his cause to the Lord. As I've said, fear is a warning flag. What will you do about the things you fear? Sometimes there are steps that you yourself can take, but there are many times when the outcome is in the hands of the Lord and beyond our control. That doesn't mean that we have no idea how things might turn out, because we know who decides the outcome, and we know that he has promised to answer prayer. Commit your, way to, commit your cause to the Lord, because he has promised, first of all, that he will deliver you. Jeremiah may have been ignorant that there was a plot against his life, but he was not ignorant of how bad the situation was in his country at that time. In fact, 
Because so many people had turned away from the Lord and were worshiping idols, and because there was so much wickedness and people being so hardened in sin, God told Jeremiah he wanted him to be his prophet in such a wicked time. God said that Judah was going to be conquered and the people taken into exile. And before that would happen, God sent Jeremiah to warn people. And so that means that when you read the book of Jeremiah, a lot of his message is law. He warned the people of Judah about the consequences of their sin. He had to prophesy that what his people were doing would lead to their destruction, the the destruction of their homes, of their villages, and of society. I bet a lot of his sermons were two-part. Repent or else. When I was a student, I heard a preacher that I got the impression really looked forward to having certain sinners burn in hell. Now, that was not Jeremiah's attitude. Jeremiah loved his people. He understood their resistance to his warnings. But he was sent by the Lord, and no doubt he came with this conviction that the Lord was sending him because something could be done, people could be changed, that his preaching would change the hearts of some people. But it appears that Jeremiah was idealistic about what would happen. He certainly was naive about human nature. It turns out that not only were the people not changing, but men from his own hometown were plotting to kill him. These were people who knew him from the time he was a little boy, and they were so determined not just to put an end to his life and an end to his ministry, they said they wanted to make it so that nobody ever would remember Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah wasn't afraid because he, knew, he didn't know these things were that bad. But the Lord opened his eyes, and he opened them for two reasons. One, of course, was to protect Jeremiah. But the other reason is one that you and I also need to constantly keep in front of us. Jesus talked about this a great deal. And that is that wherever you faithfully bring the word of God, Wherever you strive to be faithful to the Lord, there will be opposition. This is a reality. People who think otherwise are ignoring what the Lord has said about this and are naive about what life is like in this planet. The Bible is frank when it says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, Jeremiah didn't give up when he saw how terrible the opposition was. And he doesn't question God either. In fact, since God was the one who opened his eyes to the situation, he trusted that God also would help him deal with it. And so he asks the Lord to deliver him. Now maybe in his devotions he used Psalm 94 at this time. Because Psalm 94 is a perfect psalm to reflect on in such a situation. When a Christian faces the kind of opposition and the kind of hatred that Jeremiah was facing from even his own people in his own village, I'm sure one of his reactions was, well, what have I done to bring this on myself? I'm not a perfect person. I'm someone who deserves a lot of criticism. Who am I to ask the Lord for help when I look back and think about how I have felt about people and talked to them and treated them? But Psalm 94 reminds us to bring the Lord into the equation, not just to look at ourselves. The psalm says, The Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. When I said, My foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. In every situation, our comfort is is always in Jesus. We start from the point that we did not choose him. He chose us. He brought us the message of forgiveness of sins and he rescued us and redeemed our lives to serve his purpose. He will not forsake his inheritance, Psalm 94 says, and 
when you read that psalm, you discover we are his inheritance. We are the remnant out of the world, those whom he has taken for himself. We belong to him. And because he died for our sins, we can be sure that he loves us. Because he used the circumstances of our lives to make us despair of our own righteousness. And by the power of the gospel, he's opened our eyes to the only way to heaven. We know that when our foot is slipping, he will catch and protect us. Whatever your situation, when you are in danger or some frightening life problem, commit your cause to the Lord. Believe that he will deliver you. He has already delivered you from the worst thing that you could have ever experienced in your life. Like Jeremiah, a lot of us have been naive about Satan and his, his, the danger he poses. We don't think of him as a roaring lion prowling about looking for someone to devour. But the Lord opened our eyes, and for each of us, sin has been this struggle in our life, but the Lord has showed us that our struggle is not just a struggle to behave better. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Our lives are at stake here. And in this battle, which we cannot fight, win because we've already lost it, the Lord steps forward and rescues us. And that's why that passage that starts out, the wages of sin is death, goes on, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If the Lord has delivered you, so that you could belong to him forever. Is there any chance that the Lord does not care about this situation that you're scared of? He has promised in the Psalms, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Whatever your cause is, commit it to the Lord, believing that his promise to deliver you. It may seem hopeless, it may seem impossible, but resurrection from the dead is impossible, and yet Jesus rose from the dead. It may seem like you have no right to expect help. You don't, but the Lord will never forsake his inheritance. The words of the Bible hold true for you as well. Never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Commit your cause to the Lord, trusting that he will deliver you. There's another reason to commit your cause to the Lord. When you're facing frightening situations like Jeremiah, you will learn that he will vindicate you. Jeremiah's enemies thought they could do more than just simply put an end to Jeremiah. They wanted to stomp out even his memory. Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. People would not remember Jeremiah. His predictions would be forgotten and his ministry a failure. Now how does a minister react in that type of environment? Jeremiah didn't ask God to give him a new call, to get him out of Judah. He didn't complain that the work was too discouraging. Instead, he asked God to confront those enemies. It sounds strange to our ears to hear a man of God call out for vengeance, but he wasn't calling out for revenge personally on his, in his case. He was asking the Lord to fight for his cause. The enemies were opposing the message that Jeremiah had been sent, and so God, Jeremiah calls on God to demonstrate who's in charge and to show that God's word cannot be silenced. Our Savior himself warned us that if he was opposed and put to death, we should not expect that such things could never happen to us. The Bible is full of accounts of God's people suffering even though they were faithful to him. Today when Christians suffer unjustly, they sometimes question God. How could God let this happen to me? What have I done to deserve this? They forget that even though Joseph resisted the temptation to commit adultery, 
For his honorable behavior, he was thrown into prison. His suffering had nothing to do. Oops, I just touched something by accident, I think. His suffering had nothing to do with his guilt. Rather, at the end of the book of Genesis, he looks back and he sees that the Lord was using all of these things. Should I just close this one out? Uh, I'll close out. We can during the offering. We can bring the other one back up. So Joseph was innocent and yet thrown into prison, and he was there for years upon years. And yet, at the end of the story, we see he not only the Lord not only saved Joseph, he saved Joseph's family. He saved countless lives in Egypt. He was working his plan. When you face disapproval for your Christian life, when your Christian values are portrayed as narrow-minded, bigoted, remember Joseph's accusers and Jeremiah's enemies. Commit your cause to the Lord who will vindicate you too. Years ago, one of the professors at the seminary up in Mequon had made his own screensaver. You know, when the, the computer goes dormant, it, it'll put a picture up there, or have, it used to especially have things that would change. And this was a set of words that kept going across the screen. And those words said, not in vain, not in vain, not in vain. One of the seminary students saw that happen to the professor's computer one day, and he asked the professor why he had chosen that expression for his screensaver. The professor pointed out that these are the words of 1 Corinthians 15. The full verse reads, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The professor said those words were a great comfort to him, especially when he was feeling frustrated or discouraged. Not in vain. Your life and what's going on in your life and the ways that you are serving the Lord is not in vain. It may seem that way at times. You'll not always see the fruit of your labor. You'll not always live to see the answer to your prayers. You'll often experience the opposition of the world. But the last chapter of world history has not been written yet. Jeremiah's enemies thought they could stamp out his memory, but today we all know Jeremiah, but who knows the name of even one of those enemies? 3,000 years later, their plot was foiled. The Lord vindicated Jeremiah. On your darkest days, at your most frightened moments, maybe you should post those words not in vain on the mirror in your bathroom or put them on your refrigerator The Lord will vindicate you. Commit your cause to him. Satan says, who are you to believe such a thing? But we know we belong to the Lord. Our cause is in the hands of our Savior. He who conquered sin, death, and Satan on the cross is surely able to deliver us and vindicate our faith in him. We do not serve him in vain. Amen.